Welcome back to Computer Science 340. This week we're talking about the graph data structure. Now what makes a graph data structure important and uh, unique is that it represents different relationships between the data that's being stored inside of it. And so this hasn't really been the case for the other data structures we've looked at. If you have an array or a linked list or a stack or a queue or a heap of things, you don't really uh, talk about or are concerned with relationships that exist between the different things that are being stored. In a heap or a um, binary tree, you binary search tree, you do have sort of a hierarchy thing going on, but it's not like relationships between the data itself. It's just this one is less than this one or this one's bigger than this one. So in a graph, you do keep track of and maintain relationships between the different pieces of data. And so the way it's done is we ha will have nodes and edges connecting them. So it looks sort of like a tree in some ways, except we can have like total flexibility in terms of what connects up to what. So for an example, one of the things we'll do this week is we'll look at a um, graph that represents different cities and edges between the different cities represent that those two cities are connected with a road. And so you can build a graph representing intersections or cities or areas or sort of, sort of like a two-dimensional uh, thing like that. You also could represent relationships over social media networks with graphs, and this is a thing that people have done and, and have done like processing on them. So if you are in a like friend relationship with somebody else on social media, there would be an edge connecting the two of your nodes. And so then you can do things like see how polarized people are and, and do all kinds of like different processing on the graph made up of social media people if, if you are interested in that kind of thing. You also could make a graph representing all of the pages on a website. So if you have a website with a whole bunch of pages that sort of link to each other, you could have nodes for all of the pages. And if a node is connected with an edge to another node, it means that page links to the other page. So then you can do things like find out how many is the most number of clicks that you could have to take to get to a certain page. You can find um, pages that don't have any edges coming into them and you can do other kinds of processing. So once you can like take some information and represent it in a graph, then it opens you up to doing all kinds of like well-studied and uh, standard graph algorithms on them. So in this video, we're gonna talk about how you actually like make a graph in a Java program and how do you represent the data. Um, there's a couple of ways to do it and we'll look at two of them, the adjacency matrix and the incidence list. Then in the next videos in this week, we're gonna talk about a couple different graph algorithms. First, we'll talk about Dijkstra's algorithm, which finds the shortest path through a graph between any two nodes. Then we'll talk about minimum spanning trees and what those are and why they're important. And then we'll look at Prim's algorithm for finding minimum spanning trees. And then in the last video, we're going to look at a very hard problem, hard not in terms of like how hard it is for us to code it, but hard in terms of it takes a super long time and it's gonna have a really, uh, really awful big O, which is the traveling salesman problem. So we'll look at why this problem is so difficult and talk a little bit about other problems that are really, really uh, hard to solve like this. So let's go ahead and get started by looking at what a graph is, it's sort of its definition, and then some different terminology surrounding graphs. All right, so a graph is a data structure that looks sort of like this. In a graph, we have some nodes, which are the same things that they are in trees or linked lists even, just one sort of piece of information. The nodes can represent whatever is being stored in the structure, and just like with a link list or a tree, we can put anything inside of these nodes that we want. Right now, they're just sort of numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. They're sort of indexed, but we can also store whatever information inside of there that we want to. The other thing that's important for a graph is edges. Edges are these purple lines that connect up different nodes, and what they mean depends on what you're doing with the graph. So again, if these nodes represent cities in an area, then the purple edges can represent that there is a road between those two cities. Or if these nodes represent users of some website, then it could represent, the edges could represent that there is a friend relationship between those two users. So that's the important thing with a graph. The nodes and edges sort of represent whatever it is that you're trying to represent. They're really flexible. So there's different types of graphs. This graph here, as it's shown, is an undirected graph because there is no direction given to any of these edges. 
zero and one have a relationship, but it doesn't have any particular direction at all. It just shows that they're linked together. We can also have what's called a directed graph. And in that case, the edges are going to have some kind of direction going to them. And that's represented with arrowheads like I've now added to this drawing here. So whether you're using an undirected graph or a directed graph, again, depends on what sort of application you're dealing with. If these are cities with roads between them, then it can represent that some of the streets are one-way streets. Or if this is some social media things don't have like a bi-directional friendship relationship, they just have like whether you're following this other person. And so then you would need to use a directed graph because if node zero is following node one, that's not the same thing as node one following node zero, right? Likewise, for the other quick example I gave you of using a graph, if you have different pages and you're keeping track of what pages in your website link to which other pages, you would want to use a directed graph because page zero can link to page one without page one necessarily linking back to page zero. With a directed graph, you can have sort of both directions, like this edge between node zero and node two here has both arrowheads, which indicates that the direction goes both ways. So in a directed graph, you can have two-way streets, it's just that you can also have one-way streets. We can also have, we have sort of more terminology for this, this graph is currently unweighted, which means that the edges are just like a binary thing. Either there is an edge here or there's not an edge. In other types of graphs, we can have what's called a weighted graph. And in that case, all of the edges are gonna have some sort of number value associated with them, like this. And in that case, what the edges mean is they have some sort of weight associated with them. And again, that depends on the application. So for example, if you were doing the cities connected by streets, you would imagine that the weight represents the distance of that road. How long is that road or how long does it take to travel? In some applications, you would want to know that because if you're finding shortest paths through a route of cities, like a network of towns like this, then you would need to take into account how long the roads actually are to do that. Whereas in some other applications like the other two, I think the website links, it doesn't, there's no real like weight or cost associated with each link. It's just whether it links or not. So we have weighted and unweighted graphs. Okay, so I cleaned up these terms a little bit because we have some more to add to this list. The next one is connected versus unconnected, or I guess we have unconnected here. And so what that means is if you have a graph that's connected, then that means you can get from one node to any other node in the graph. And so if we look at this, this is not a connected graph because there's no path to take us from node zero, for instance, to node four. There's no way to do that. So let me add some edges to make it a connected graph. Okay, so with the addition of this edge, taking us from node zero to node four, it makes this a connected graph. Even though it has a super high weight of 80, it doesn't matter. There just has to be some path from one node to every other node. That doesn't have to be a direct path though, because if you notice, there's no direct path from node four to node zero. We can't go directly there along any edge, but we can go from node four to node three to node two and then on to node zero. So it doesn't have to be a direct path to be connected, but it does have to be a path. We also have something called a complete graph and a complete graph is like a connected graph, except there has to be a direct path from one node to every other node. This is not a complete graph, but let me draw one that is. Okay, here we have a complete graph of four nodes. There's a direct path from each node to each other node. And I've done this as an undirected graph, but if it was a directed graph, there would have to be edges going in both directions between every node, like that. So this is now a complete graph because every node connects up to every other single node. Coming back to this graph, we can talk about a couple other terms. We can talk about cyclic graphs and acyclic graphs. And what a cyclic graph is, is it's a graph that has a cycle in it. And a cycle is like a route between three nodes that takes you in a loop. So here is a cycle in this graph. We go from node three to node two to node one and back to node three. And so we have this loop here, this cycle where we can basically loop in the graph over and over and over again. This makes this a cyclic graph. Okay, now I've taken out some edges from this graph and now I think I've made it acyclic. There's no path from one node back to that node again. So from zero, if I leave zero, I can't go back to zero. If I can't even leave one in the first place, if I leave two, I can't ever get back to two and same with three and four. So this is an acyclic graph, there's no cycles. 
an acyclic graph wouldn't really make sense, I don't think, for any of the uh, things we've talked about so far. So like if we have a graph of cities, you wouldn't want to like, well, if you leave Fredericksburg, you can never get back to Fredericksburg. There's no road to take you back. That would be kind of ridiculous. Likewise, I think for websites, you would want to link back to the main page and then go back to the page you were on. Those things make sense to have cycles, but there are other uses of graphs. One of them is for sort of like representing like tasks that have to be scheduled and dependencies between those tasks. So like in this case, one depends on zero and zero depends on two and two depends on three and three depends on four. And so you could look at a graph this way such that you have to sort of like satisfy four before you can move on to three and three before you have to move on to two and so on. So they're used a lot for like sort of like task scheduling problems and finding out how to satisfy all the constraints in sort of this sort of like complex scheduling thing. So that's what cyclic and acyclic mean. So there's lots of different types of graphs and they can be used for lots of different types of problems. Now let's turn our attention to thinking about how do we actually represent a graph in a Java program. All right, there's a couple different ways that we can represent a graph in a Java program. We're gonna talk about two of them. The first of these is the adjacency matrix. And based on the name, you have this matrix of numbers and that matrix represents the edges that exist between the different nodes. So if you have five nodes in the graph, like in this case, you'd have a five by five table like this. If you have 23 nodes, then you'd have a 23 by 23 matrix. The rows are for edges leaving that node and the columns are for edges entering that node. And so for example, if we have this edge here, this one that goes from zero to one with a weight five, then we would represent that in this box and we put a five right here. This says that there's an edge from node zero to node one and it has a weight of five. Then likewise, this one here from node two to node zero with a weight eight would be right here. It goes from node two to node zero and it has a weight of eight. I'll go ahead and put the other edges into this matrix now. Okay, there we are, we're done. And what we can do is we can go ahead and I won't draw them on this graph, but the other boxes here would be filled in with zeros. And so then when you're processing through the graph, you can look and see if there's a zero in the corresponding cell, that means there is no edge. Whereas if there is a value, you would say that there's an edge with that value. If zero is allowed as a cost, then you can use like negative one instead. Again, a lot of what you do with a graph sort of depends on the actual application that you're using it for and what makes the most sense. Maybe it makes sense to have edges with zero cost and maybe it doesn't but you need some kind of sentinel value to indicate that there is no edge here. Note that it's possible with the adjacency matrix to have edges from a node to itself. So you could possibly have here like an edge from node three back to node three. And in some cases that might be a thing that makes sense. And in some cases it might not be. So that would be three to three right here. So in some cases like cities connected by streets, it doesn't really make sense to say there's a street from one place to itself because you're like already there. But in other cases it might, like a web page could link to itself and that could be a thing that makes sense to keep track of. And so the adjacency matrix, sort of this uh, diagonal line here indicates that those are the edges from a node back to its own self. So this is not too terribly hard to implement in Java code. So let's go ahead and look at how that would be done. Okay, here we have a class that does this. We have this class called graph, and here we have a private 2D array of integers for the matrix. Then we also have the size of the graph in nodes. How many nodes does it have? When you make the graph and call upon the constructor, you pass in the size, then you save that and then allocate your 2D matrix of values. And in this case, it looks like we initialize them all to zero. Again, you could use negative one instead if that makes more sense. Then we have some code to insert edges. So we can insert an edge from a node with a given index to a node with a given index with a given cost just by placing it into the matrix, which is pretty simple. And you can also delete an edge from the graph just by overwriting that edge cost with zero again. And then we have a method to just get the cost back out. So that's a pretty simple way of doing this, but that's basically all there is to adjacency matrices. The way that we have this set up right now is for a directed weighted graph. 
if you wanted to make this for an undirected graph where the edge sort of like goes both ways, you could basically do something like this and say, not only are we going to insert it this way, but we're going to insert it the other way as well. That would work. And now we've made this essentially a undirected graph because we put, put in both directions right away. And then when we call our get cost method here, whichever way you put it in, it'll find the same edge. We also could have made this an unweighted graph by instead of keeping track of integers here, we could have made this booleans instead and then initialize them all to false. And then when you call the insert edge method, you won't put in a cost, we'll just set it to true. And then that way we'll be basically doing the same thing, except instead of having the weights, we'll just store true, there is an edge here or false, there isn't. So the adjacency matrix idea could like be expanded in those directions if you wanted it to. All right, the next way we'll talk about representing a graph inside of a program is with an incidence list. Now an incidence list is different from an adjacency matrix in that instead of having a 2D array, you have an array of link lists. And so now we have this array that is five cells big because there's five nodes. So we have five link lists stored in an array together. And to add the edges into the graph, what you do is you add them into the corresponding link list. So this node here has one edge leaving it, the zero node does, and it goes from node zero to node one with a weight of five. And so what we're going to do is we're going to insert into the link list an edge object, which stores both of those things. It's going to store the destination of one and also the weight of five. Node one would have an empty link list. It would be, its head would be pointing to null essentially. I guess these are all the head values essentially that we're storing as it's drawn here. And node two has two edges. It has one going to node zero with a weight of eight. And then it has another one going to node one with a weight of 10. Node three has two. It has one going to node two with a weight of four. And then it has one going to itself, node three with a weight of 10. And then lastly, four has two as well. We have one going to node one with a weight of nine, and then we have one going to node three with a weight of six. And so for every edge you have in the graph, you insert it into the link list in the corresponding slot. So that is how it's done. We'll talk about the pros and cons of incidence list versus adjacency matrix in a second, but first let's look at the implementation for this. All right. To make this a little simpler, we just imported the Java built-in link list class for use here. Then inside of the class graph, we have a private class called edge. The reason for doing that is so that we can represent these boxes as one thing because it basically is storing the destination of the edge along with the weight of the edge. Of course, if you were doing an unweighted graph, you wouldn't need to do that. You could just make it an array of destinations. But here we put the destination, which we've called two, along with the weight, which we've called cost. Then this thing just has a couple little helper methods. One is a constructor that just sets up the, th the two things inside of it. And the other is a dot equals method. And that's so that we can search through the link list to see if we have an edge going to the place. So it returns whether the two things are equal, if they have the same destination or not. Then we have our array of link lists. So this isn't a thing we've done too much so far in this class where we sort of like aggregate the data structures we've talked about. We've talked about arrays and we've talked about link lists, but here we have an array of link lists, which is of course a thing you can do. You could also make a link list of link lists if you wanted to, but here we just have it as a array of link lists. So we go ahead and make the array of link lists of the given size. And then we set all of those link lists just to be a new empty link list with no nodes in it. Then in order to insert an edge, what we do is we go and index our array of link lists here called nodes with from as the index that looks down this array and finds the appropriate slot in it and accesses that link list. Then we call the dot add method on that link list and make a new edge combining up the destination where it's going to along with the cost of the edge. 
The remove method does the same thing. It indexes the array of linked lists to find one of the linked lists in particular with the from node. Then it calls the dot remove method, and then it passes in a new edge with the same destination. And that's why that dot equals was important because the dot remove method searches through all of the linked list edges, and it's going to find one that equals this one basically because it has the same destination, and then it's going to remove it from the linked list. Then our get cost method here also relies on a built-in linked list method. So we find the index of the edge inside of the appropriate linked list. By first, we have to find the right linked list. So we do nodes uh, bracket from to get the appropriate linked list. Then we call the dot index of method with an edge with the same destination. So if it finds it, it's going to return us the index. Otherwise, it's going to return us negative one. So if it gave us negative one, then we say zero because uh, here we're representing an empty edge with cost of zero, or it'll go ahead and access the appropriate linked list, then app access the appropriate cell in that linked list and then return the cost of it. So a little bit more complicated than the adjacency matrix, but we're sort of relying on the linked list methods imported here to do some of the heavy lifting. So let's now compare the incidence list method to the adjacency matrix. They have some trade-offs involved. So first, the adjacency matrix is just a little bit quicker to insert, remove edges, and also to get costs. Because we're basically just accessing this 2D array, we can go directly to the cell in order to put in the thing for, uh, put in the cost for an insert call or we can go directly there to remove the edge and likewise to get the cost. With the incidence list, inserting is pretty quick because we can insert into a linked list in big O of one time, but removing a node the way we implemented it, it's going to have to search through the list to find one with the appropriate cost to remove it, which is going to be the uh, big O of however many edges we expect that node to have. Likewise, getting the cost, we have to search through the list of edges to see if one matches. The benefit of the incidence list is that it's better for sparse graphs. And now what do I mean by a sparse graph? I mean one that doesn't have tons of edges. So we could have, if we have a graph with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight nodes, we could have a couple of different graphs based off of these eight nodes. One could be really dense like this, where lots of things are connected to lots of other things. Or it could look like this, where there's not that many edges. And so here we have a dense graph, and here we have a sparse graph. And so now why is the incidence list better for sparse graphs? Well, if we want to loop over all of the edges leaving a node, for instance, if we want to do it with this one, we'd only have to look at the two things that are in the linked list. We don't have to look through all of the edges that could be there. Whereas if you were doing this with an adjacency matrix, you'd have this long row and you'd have to go to the row leaving that node and you'd have to scan over all of these things, even though most of them are zeros indicating there isn't anything there. So with an adjacency matrix, if you want to like scan through all of the edges leaving or going in to one of the cells, you have to scan through the entire set of all the edges that might exist Whereas with the incidence list, you only have to scan through the edges that actually do exist. So in general, if you have or expect to have a dense graph like this, an adjacency matrix is definitely going to be better. Whereas with an incidence list, it takes a little bit of more time to insert and remove edges. But if you're going to be like scanning through the graph and looking at all the edges leaving or entering something, it's going to be quicker with the incidence list because of this reason, if you expect to have a sparse graph. Okay, now our last topic is to talk about how you would actually go about storing data in the graph. Right now, the code we've looked at, it only stores the edge information. Are these nodes connected with edges? It doesn't actually store any data inside the node, which we're going to want to do, I think, almost all of the time. And so it depends on if you're doing an incidence list or an adjacency matrix. For the incidence list, I think the thing that you would want to do is you would want to store inside of each of these cells of your array in addition to a linked list, you would also want to store the data that you want. So we were are gonna like basically cut these things in half. And so each element of this array is not only a linked list, but it also stores whatever data we want. So we store for each cell of this array, the data we wanna store and also the linked list that we're keeping track of like this. Then for the adjacency matrix, it's a little bit trickier because we can't 
like subdivide these things because we're not storing data for every edge, we're storing data for only every node. So I think the simplest way to do it is to just make a whole nother array. And I'll go ahead and call this one like the values array and this one the matrix. So here we have two arrays now. One is called matrix and it stores all your edge information. And then the other one we're gonna call the values array and it stores all of the actual data associated with each thing. So then if this first cell wanted to store the name Fredericksburg because we're representing cities, that would go here. And this one could be Richmond and so on. Whatever value you're storing here, you know, if it's the social media graph thing, it could be the user's username. Or if it's the websites, it could be the URL for the page. You know, whatever data you want to store is going to go inside of this other array here. We'll only talk about code for this for the adjacency matrix, which is the way we're going to be representing graphs in all of our examples, just because it's a little bit simpler, I think, than the incidents list. So here we have a graph.java file for storing a graph that is based on an adjacency matrix, and it's a directed weighted graph, and it also allows you to put information along with each node. So we have the same 2D array of ints that we did from last time for our matrix, and now we have this, an array of type objects called values. Here type is our type parameter because this can be a graph that stores numbers or strings or you know, whatever you want. Then we have the same constructor here, the first part of it that sets up our matrix, but then we also go ahead and allocate our array of objects as well. The insert edge and remove edge and get cost methods are all exactly identical, but now we also have the set value method here. And this goes ahead and puts a value into our values array so that we can associate, okay, node zero is storing this information, node one is storing this information and so on. So this is the class that we're going to base our examples off of as we look at like Dijkstra's algorithm, Prim's algorithm, and so on. The notes page for today has all of the terminology we talked about, and it has the idea and the code behind both the adjacency matrix and the incidence list, as well as a link to this graph.java that we ended up with as our final sort of code example for today. So next time, like I said, we're going to be looking at Dijkstra's algorithm to find the shortest path in a graph.